Welcome to Advanced Broadcast Technology. I am your host, Chris Graham, here for Palab Chatterjee, who is out on assignment. Now, I'm pleased today to welcome to our show David Schwaderer. David earned his master's degree in applied mathematics from the California Institute of Technology and an MBA from USC. Fight on. As a multidisciplinary technologist, David is a prolific author whose works and seminars touch on a wide range of technologies, including digital communications, programming, and technical innovation. We're fortunate today to have David share some interesting insights in the fundamentals of chroma subsampling in the context of digital vision compression. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Chris, for that lovely introduction. It's a privilege to be here today and share with the audience some fundamentals of chroma subsampling. Now, chroma subsampling is a very widely misunderstood uh, uh, technological consideration. And we're going to have a little uh, plot spoiler here. We're going to try and cover it in about six minutes and then explain some of the fundamental uh, reasons why it exists as it does. So uh, I would encourage everybody to find this particular uh, pamphlet online uh, from Konica Minolta. It is uh, Precision Color Communication. It is a PDF. You can download it. I've actually taken some images out of this particular publication. It is for printing, not for uh, digital video, but a lot of very, very good information. Highly recommend it. What is chroma subsampling? Fair question. A lot of people can't answer that question, but you're going to in about five minutes. It is a first digital compression step. And what it does is it, by formula, algorithmically throws away some of the color information in a color image and feeds the remaining information into the subsequent digital compression techniques, which we're not going to be covering today. The rationale for it is, is that the human eye or the human vision system is actually fairly quirky and it is much more sensitive to levels of lightness and darkness versus color uh, differentiation. So as a result of that, you can really get away with a lot by throwing out a lot of the color. Uh, how much you can throw out depends on what you're looking at, but in general you can do a pretty good job by throwing out a lot of the color. The color is known as chroma, CR, CBCR will be referring to it, and the brightness will be referred to as luma in the subsequent part of the presentation. Now, don't be scared. Here's a couple of terms. There are a couple of uh, terms up here, chroma subsampling uh, uh, examples, uh, a 422 chroma subsample, a 420 chroma subsample. We'll be discussing this pretty much in detail, and you'll have a very, very good idea as what they are. 422 leaves about 67% of the original image information there, and a 420 leaves about 50% of the information there. What's nice about it is, is that viewers typically don't notice that it's missing, so you can, you can reduce the amount of data transmitted or stored and uh, without, a, without materially affecting the, uh, the actual images. Well, let's do a quick review of what a full HD environment is. Full HD, if this is a full HD display, there will be 1080 scan lines and each one of the scan lines will have 1920 RGB pixels per scan line. This is a picture of a pixel. It has three components, a red component and a green component and a blue component for a display. We're talking about additive color here, not printing. Three components. Each one of these components is, is described by a, a set of bits if there are eight bits per component, eight for red, eight for green, eight for blue, then you'll have 24 bits in total. Two to the 24 possible color variations. If it's 10 bits per component, you will have 30 bits per pixel, two to the 30 different uh, colors there. Now, at 24 bit full HD, streaming at 30 frames per second, what this means is it's 1920 times 1080 by three by 30 and that is 187 megabytes about per second uncompressed raw data. Hmm, that's quite a bit. Well, in a minute, it's 11.2 gigabytes and that's uh, pretty significant as well. 
If it's 4K, which is four times the size, that means that it's 44.8 gigabytes per minute uncompressed data. And in an hour, it's uh, 2.69 terabytes. In a word, what we're talking about is lots and lots of raw data. So let's hop right into it. Full HD block processing. What we have is our full HD display again. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to divide that display up into non-overlapping blocks, four pixels wide, two pixels high. On the screen is, is, a, is an image of this. So having done this, what you will see now is, is uh, the, um, uh, the screen's been cut up into its uh, uh, various four blocks, and there's a whole bunch of them. They're on, uh, in a row, there'll be 480 of these, and in a column, there will be 540 of them. So why do we pick four by two? Well, you'll see in a minute, it's a very effective sampling uh, strategy, and these blocks are actually process independent of one another. So for full HD at 1920 by 1080, we have about 259,000 of these blocks on a screen, full HD. At 30 frames per second, that is 30 full HD uh, images per second in raw data. <laughs> that is about 8 million of these blocks per second. So it's quite a quite a bit. At 4K, well, it's about 31 million per second. Now, this is the meat of the discussion right here. This is a crash course on chroma subsampling. I've done everything I can to make it as simple as possible. It involves a transform called YCBCR. Don't worry, here it is. Individual RGB pixels are transformed into another form. There's your RGB pixel. One third, of the, one third of the bits describing this pixel will be for the red, one third for green, one third for blue. It gets transformed into something called YCBCR, and I've used colors here to make sure that you understand that CB and CR are different from one another and not particularly related. There, the Y, the Y value in this transform is one third of the bits. The CB is one third and the CR is one third as well. The Y is known as the Luma channel. The CBCR is known as the chroma. Think of it as watercolors that you would put on a black and white image to make it a color image. So here's the transform concept. We have a color image here. Beautiful eye. This is color image. This is the Luma channel. It's a black and white image. Very recognizable from the color image, but it's a, it's a separate image. And what we would like to do is put watercolors on the black and white image to recover the color image. This is the color palette of watercolors that you will be using to do this. So how does it work? We're going to, re, we're going to be constructing, reconstructing the color image are actually extracting the chroma information that we would put as watercolor on the Luma channel to reconstruct it. And here's how we do it. Keep a very, very close eye on the black and white eye there. See a little circle. Suppose now that that is highlighting a single pixel. You would go over to the color channel and find in that same position that pixel and notice, note the color and then you would go up to the color palette, the watercolor palette. You would find that color there, and lo and behold, you would plop that dot right there. If you do that for every one of your pixels that are sitting there, bang, that is what you get. If you take that chroma and you superimpose it on top of your Luma channel, you will, in fact, recover the entire uh, color image. There's Y is the Luma channel. And if you will notice, your color palette is in two dimensions. So there are two coordinates there, CB and CR. So there are your three values that each have eight bits in, our, in this, in this or one third of the bits in, in our example here. So block processing, <coughs> and here we go. So we take a four by two block, and for the chroma processing, what we do is we draw a sample 
These, this is uh, the colors that we supposedly found up on our palette here in our 4x2. Here are example pixel colors for each one of the pixels. That's your CBCR. And we're going to subsample this here. There are multiple methods, and we will be describing what they are. 444. Four, four. There are three numbers there. They each have a value of 4. The first 4 says, how big is our block width? Well, look, we're 4 by 2, so we have, a, we have a, a block here that qualifies. The second number indicates, or the second, there are two numbers behind the first number. That says there are two rows in our block. Sure enough, row 1 and row 2, so we're still on track. And what do these numbers mean? Well, if you're into uh, uh, songs like The Gambler, you know, every gambler knows the secret to surviving is knowing what to keep and knowing what to throw away. And we're going to be thrown away. The keepers are the second and third numbers. The keepers are the number of pixels that you are going to keep in the block. The chroma. So here we have it, 444. Four, four. We're going to keep four colors in the first row, four colors in the second row. Well, there's only four colors in the first row and four colors in the second row, so we're done. We're all over. It's done. You started with chroma for eight pixels. You left with the chroma for eight pixels when you were done. That was two-thirds of the bits, and the one-third of the bit was your lumus, so boom, you have 100% of your information there. You didn't really do anything, and it's kind of lossless, except you'll see that there's some multiplications involved, and you're going to lose a little bit of accuracy. But 100% um, of the luma is preserved, and 100% of the chroma is preserved here. Here is another transform. 422, where our block is four blocks, uh, four bits wide. It is, and the first two there says how many of the chroma samples are we going to keep in the top row? Two. The next number is also two. How many are we going to keep in the bottom row? The answer is two. So let's do it. Well, if you're an engineer, the secret to compression is knowing what to keep and knowing what to throw away, and by golly, we've just thrown it away. We've kept two chroma samples on top, Two in the bottom. That's our 422, but we got a problem now. We don't have any color for the pixel, for the uh, chroma samples that we had. We don't have anything there. It can't have a black and white. So what we do is we simply replicate. Throw away and replicate. How does that work? Well, we started with chroma samples for eight pixels. We wound up with four, which we then replicated, and that left us with 67% of the original raw data. Lossy chroma, lossless luma, because luma is always left intact. Now, how do we know which ones we're going to keep? Well, it's standardized by uh, international standards. And so the ones that I kept there, those are the ones that you're going to keep. 420, how would this work? Well, our block is four, four chroma samples wide, sure enough. And we're going to keep two two samples on the top and none on the bottom. Bang, there it is. Two on top, none on the bottom. But we have the same problem again. We have no chroma information to put in to recover our original color, so we have to replicate. And that's how you replicate. So we started off with chroma for eight pixels. We wound up with chroma for two. This leaves us with 50% of the raw data information. Lossy, chroma, lossless luma again. Luma is always lossless. 411, what would this be? We're going to keep chroma from one pixel on top and one pixel on the bottom. So there it is, one on top, one on the bottom. Replicate, done. This leaves us with 50% of the raw data. And of course, there's the good old standby 400, which means you're throwing away all the color and all you're going to keep be keeping is the black and white image. That's just an achromatic black and white image. So now we've prepared our data and we shove it into the rest of the compression steps. We do this for every block. Uh, each frame gets processed similarly and we continue uh, with our compression process using uh, YCBCR uh, on a frame basis. Here are pictures out of Wikipedia here. 
the, the top row, there is uh, various strategies that have been used, and you will see that the pictures are, the color pictures are pretty much alike, but you can see there's a great difference in what was thrown out in the chroma from the, uh, uh, the bottom set of pictures there. So now that we've described chroma subsampling, let's take a look at some of the reasons why it works. And it involves light, objects, reflections, and the eye. So we have uh, a light source, and light comes from the light source, and it hits uh, an object. Object absorbs a lot of wavelengths, reflects some, and into an eye. So there's your light source, there's your object, there's your reflected light, and there's your human visual system. Note that some light sources are known as illuminants. These are very special light sources that are characterized in a very known and standardized way. Well, the human eye is a little bit, little bit imprecise. It turns out that the, the red ball in this, in this uh, diagram here is a little bit darker than the one on top, but you might not notice it unless it was pointed out. And if you were to give a, an apple you know, put an apple out on the, on the street and ask people what color it was, and you'd get a variety of answers. Well, unfortunately, in science and data compression and data transmissions and TV sets and displays and everything else, that's not going to work. What you need is precision. You must be able to reduce everything down to numbers and quantify them and be very, very precise in that manner. Ask Lord Kelvin. Now, light is a form of electromagnetic energy, and there's a whole bunch of forms of it, all the way from cosmic rays down to heat waves and things like that. A very narrow band in this electromagnetic energy wavelength spectrum is a little thing called visible light. And if you shine light through that into a prism, it breaks out into its individual constituent colors, as you've seen, it, as in a prism. And this is another another uh, uh, a diagram of that uh, uh, phenomenon to, uh, to make it very clear. And the numbers you'll see in the various sources of the, of the wavelengths that, that the human eye can detect uh, vary a little bit. Now, illuminants are the standardized uh, entities that I referred to before. Here are nine different of them. And if you look at the wavelengths of electromagnetic energy that these, these uh, illuminants have, well, they all turn out to be very different although they are all used as, quote, white light. Trust me here. All use as white light, but in truth is there is no such thing as white light, which is why you have white balance in your cameras and things like that to try and shift amongst uh, your various uh, light sources. So what you see when you go and look at it is in this narrow band and you, you, you get all of the light coming in, you do a mixing and the brain says, oh, it's red, even though there's a whole bunch of other light frequencies in there that are anything but red. So we have uh, one, one light source here, one spectrum here, and we bounce it off of an apple, which uh, that's the reflectivity of the apple. And you notice a big peak over there on the right-hand side. Well, that says I'm, I'm going to be reflecting red and absorbing everything else. Well, that's what a so-called red apple looks like. It looks like that. If you get a different light source, it will have a different spectral energy. Bounce it off the same apple, you will get a different curve. But the eye will still tell you that it is red, even though those curves are anything but similar. You can think of it like this, a red car under different lights, uh, night light, uh, sodium lights, etc. boom it always looks like a red car because of the way the brain does a lot of processing. Now, the eye is a very, very complicated uh, little, little uh, uh, organism. Um, we have, in a certain area, six million cone cells concentrated, and they're concentrated in an area called the fovea. As you move away from the fovea, what you will see is uh, you have maximum cone density at the fovea, but as, you, but as you move away, it becomes more and more interspersed with another kind of cell, which is called a rod. A rod gives you only black and white image, but great detail. Cones are good for color, not detail. So with the, the rods will give you black and white vision, and uh, your night vision. And you'll notice sometimes probably that you can look 
at a star look slightly off axis of the star and it's easier to see. You're using your rods at this point in time. So as you move away, that is what's on your eye. You still get some uh, from the fovea. If you move away from the fovea, that's what you get. And it's uh, 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 rods interspersed with, um, with your cones. So the cones are sensitive to color. And if you look at the blue sensitivity, it's a little bit higher than everything else. And so you're going to be very, very uh, more sensitive to blue. And in fact, if you look at the sensitivity curves, you can see that the sensitivity curve for blue is very high and very sharp, meaning that for shades of blue, it is uh, your eyes are very, very sensitive to shades of blue. However, there are 6 million cones in the fovea there are 120 million rods that are in black and white, and the rods are sensitive to green as far as intensity goes. So as for the entire eye, the eye is going to be more sensitive to the green tones than it will be any other uh, uh, green wavelengths rather than any other one. So, because the cones are out, <laughs> outnumbered by the rods. So the last thing here is some upside down stuff here. Uh, pinhole cameras. If you, uh, uh, you put a small hole in a box, it will produce a small upside down image, uh, very dim on, on the opposite side. If you want more light, if you want a brighter image, well, you make a bigger hole, but there's a problem. Problem is, is that light will be coming off at different angles from the same point on things in front of you. So you need a mechanism to focus. It's called a lens. And so by having a wider, wider hole requires you to have a lens there and to, to put something on the back of your eye in focus. You'll get a brighter image and um, uh, things sort of work. Now what we want to do is replace this with a camera. Unfortunately, we have a problem called refraction. And if you send the light out in different angles and it hits a lens at different angles, well, it turns into a, the, uh, a prismatic effect. And that isn't going to work because you start winding, getting fringes and things like that on your various um, uh, images. And uh, it's, it's not good at all. So the way you correct for that is you put another lens back behind your first lens, and that will, that will get rid of your prismatic effect. And uh, it, it starts to get real complicated. It's got to have a different density. It's got to have a different shape. You name it. So if you look at camera lenses that are expensive, they kind of look like that. And sideways, they look like that because there's a whole lot of glass in there trying to keep everything in focus without introducing prismatic effects. And this is why some lenses are much more expensive than other ones here. You might ask, why wouldn't this happen with the eyeball? Well, it does, and that's why blue block sunglasses work. A blue block filters out the blue, which intends to focus in front of the eye. Now, when the light goes to the camera sensor, the first thing it's going to hit is a mask. It's called a mosaic mask, typically. And there's all different kinds, but it's just little, every little collector site for, for light will have a red, green, or blue mask in front of it. This is essentially what happens. The red only lets red go through, and green and lets green go through in a certain range, and blue, and so on. But this is a very lossy process because, look, that's what your mask looks like in, when it's separated out of its individual components. And it favors green because the eye is most sensitive to green. So it's capturing quarter of the blue, quarter of the red, and 50% of the green. And that means you, you, you're, throwing, you're uh, throwing away about 68% of the light that has actually come in. So, uh, and after it captures the blue wavelengths, well, that particular area didn't capture any green or red. It's very lossy, and a whole bunch of stuff now has to happen to construct what light would have come in, red, green, or blue, from um, uh, an area that was uh, filtering everything out. Then it goes in, cameras go in, and they enhance. They do sharpening processes and saturation. They increase the color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very highly constructed image. Everything's processed and constructed for an RGB image. So we're beginning to get to the end here, here is an RGB image. It has three color planes, red, green, and blue. The transform 
for RGB to YC, CRCB looks like this. Now, if you are paying attention, you will notice that I didn't say YCBCR, I said Y prime CRCB. Well, that's because the terminology floats all over the place and some people call it YCRCB and Y prime CRCB and YCBCR, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we call this the uh, fundamentals lecture today. So we have this transform. There's the black and white picture, which is the luma, and then the two different color planes there. Actually, what happens is it's a mathematical formula that takes the bit value of a sample, chroma sample, for red, green, or blue, and it multiplies it through an equation, comes up with a number, and that's what y is, and they multiply everything out another way, and that's what cr is, and multiply another way, and that's how cb is. So these calculations involve floating point uh, uh, fractions and uh, floating point calculations, and you get a little bit of data loss in there. So there are other conversion numbers. So this is a review slide here. Chroma subsampling crash course YCBCR. We've seen this before. What I want everybody to realize is, is that even though this is a very handy way of thinking about it, using uh, uh, a palette of watercolors to watercolor a black and white image to recover the color image, that isn't what happens. What actually happens is a mathematical transform, which was on the slide before, and that gives us our YCBCR triplet. Summary. We live in a very visually intense, constructed world, visually constructed world. And this, this began, began to be very, um, uh, very apparent in the early days of the web. And I actually lifted this visually intense uh, expression from oh, uh, an article that I read in about 19, 1995. And uh, what we see is not necessarily what other people see. Some people have three types of cones. Other people have less than three. They're so-called colorblind. Some people actually have four types of cones. They're called tetrachromats and, in fact, can see colors that most people uh, will never be able to see. What imaging systems do is attempt to mimic our visual systems with all of its idiosyncrasies and compensate for things, do, do all sorts of processing. And everybody would like the camera to faithfully record what they saw, but the fact of the matter is, is that there's a whole lot of processing that's going on, and what you get is not necessarily what you saw at the, at the uh, uh, place of capture. The eye better differentiates intensity, the black and white stuff, versus the color. So that when we process everything, what we do is we leave the black and white information alone and we subsample the color. YCBR preserves fairly accurate uh, intensity information and enables color information and transformation. Eliminating chroma information naturally compresses images and after they get done, everything gets fed into uh, uh, subsequent compression steps, which are very complicated. There's, there's prediction, there's, there's, there's keyframes, there's uh, interpolation frames, um, and it's, it's all very complicated. But the fundamental beginning step is chroma subsampling. So I'd like to thank everybody for the presentation, uh, the opportunity to come and present here, and um, uh, um, good luck and good chroma subsampling.